Welcome. Welcome to Massey College and welcome to the Massey Dialogues. Today we're talking about putting water at the heart of development. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. It's my great pleasure to you here, both online and in our audience at Massey College. I want to recognize that Massey College is built on indigenous lands, the lands of the Yeronwanda, the Seneca, the Onoshone, and it is a treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land and also the great privilege that we have to be here to have this important discussion. So I have with me uh, uh, Dr. Nicolas Jarreau, who is a senior specialist, engagement and partnership development at the Global Water Partnership. He is based in Cyprus and uh, he was the Assistant Vice President for Institute Affairs at the Cyprus Institute until 2022. 15 years of environmental peace building program management uh, throughout 10 years at the United Nations peace building program in Cyprus itself. And he was involved in the creation of the Center for Sustainable Peace and Democratic Development in Cyprus. And he has a P in environmental science from Imperial College in London, but also has a experience as a freelance and a science communication person where he's contribute to the French news magazine Le Point as well. I will also be joined at Massey College with uh, uh, Professor Sapna Sharma. She is a, a professor of Department of Biology at York University. Her research is how lakes worldwide respond to climate change. Rapid ice loss, warming water temperatures, degrading water quality, and changing fish distributions. She, because of all her great research, she's been, uh, she's part of the College of New Scholars at the Royal Sea of Canada. She was named one of Canada's top 10 women water scientists. Uh, she has a prestigious Ontario Government Early Researcher Award and York University President's Emerging Research Leadership Award. She's a dedicated science communicator and the founder of SEEDS, an outreach program for refugees. And she's been invited to serve as the vice chair for the Royal Canadian Institute for Science and was awarded the Canadian Council of Uni University Biology Chair's Science Promotion Prize. And she's also a senior fellow of Massey College. Welcome, bienvenue. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and we have uh, with us as well, uh, Giancarlo Daré, who is a Massey junior fellow. He has a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Biology and he's soon to receive his Master of Global Affairs from the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. His focus has always been on innovation and emphasis and uh, really a collaborative specialization in environmental studies. He's worked as a management consultant at KG and was the president and CEO of uh, the McMaster Student Union and developed McMaster's inaugural sustainable strategies Merci beaucoup. Thank you all for being here. So let's start with you, Dr. Jarreau. Set the stage for our discussion. Uh, what should we know about what does it mean to say put water at the heart of development? Thank you very much, uh, Principal Desrosiers. Can you hear me well? Yes, bravo. So thank you, uh, Principal Desrosiers. Thank you, of course, to Massey College and, and, and the Rotary for organizing this. And, and uh, welcome also to my co-panelists, to Giancarlo Dare and, and Professor Sharma. I, I'm looking forward to this. I will jump straight into the subject because I think I've been told that I have 10 minutes to set the scene. So I will try and do that. Uh, let me see if I can share my, my presentation. Can you all see the, pre can you see the presentation? Not yet. Ah, here it Can is. You see, see it now? Perfect. Yes, it's wo yes. wonderful. Okay, so I'll, I'll, jump, I'll jump straight in. I'll try not to, to, to have too many water puns. Um, so putting water at the center of development, what does that mean? I think maybe we should rewind first and talk about what's, what's the actual problem. Um, the problem with water is actually multiple problems. Um, pretty much every sphere of human activity has an impact on our water supplies. And there are five big uh, 
problems. Uh, first of one is the most obvious is access of people to water and, and sanitation, but also the disasters which are wrought by the deregulation of the water cycle, whether those are floods and droughts. And then the, the basic water stress, which is caused partially by climate change, but all over extraction or an imbalance between supply and demand. Um, and then, of course, the, the pollution of whatever water is left by industrial activity, waste, uh, agriculture. And then finally, the consequence of this is not just on us humans, but of course, the degradation of ecosystems and the loss of biodiversity. I'll, I'll leave Professor Sharma to speak a little bit more about that. But the water problem is also a governance problem. So there is globally, uh, and I'm not pointing the finger at any specific country here, but a failure to recognize the interconnected nature of water. And I want you to remember that first point because we're going to come back to it again and again. It's connected to every other sphere of life and activity. The fact, a consequence of this, that the institutions that deal with water are fragmented and siloed. Um, and also the, the approaches that we then take to fix this are again, uh, usually focused on a single objective and quick fixes, techno fixes to try and fix individual problems, maybe rather than a holistic approach. And then overall down centralized approach to all this, which sometimes excludes uh, huge uh, proportions of the people who depend the most on water supplies. The climate crisis, of course, is a water crisis. Uh, and adaptation to climate change requires water resilience. And yet there is a shortage of pretty much every, all the tools that we need to fix this, whether it's the investment in the amount of the data that we collect, the capacity to deal with this and the awareness of water risk. So the traditional management style to dealing with water problems is, as I mentioned, this siloed approach, the, the failure to recognize that hydrological systems are connected to every other system on the planet, uh, the failure to recognize the impact of human activities on the water cycle, the siloed approach in the management of water, uh, the, the pursuing of single objectives in dealing with the water problems, uh, and, and the over-focus on technical and infrastructure solutions rather perhaps than the, the more systemic governance solutions, and finally, uh, the top-down approach. So. The answer to this is a concept called Integrated Water Resource Management, or IWRM. Uh, IWRM is exactly the opposite approach. So it takes the whole... Uh, sorry? No, you go ahead. So it takes we, we hear you perfectly. Yeah. Okay, great. So the Integrated Water Management, as its name suggests, takes a holistic approach. It takes the whole basin as your operational unit. Whatever is happening in that basin it will affect the water system, whether it's agriculture, industry, uh, waste management, etc. Energy production, for example, through hydroelectrics. Um, we then uh, look at the governance, where we again promote a coordinated governance system across ministries, across departments, across boundaries across uh, uh, borders and then we take a multi-objective planning so, so we you don't try just try and fix the water problem but you do that in a way that creates jobs that is socially equitable that benefits economic growth uh, and then we look at a more pro-oriented approach which can of course involve technology but technology within a context of good solid governance and then finally a participatory approach which means everyone is involved I know that Professor Sharma uh, mentioned she was uh, uh, hosting a session at the UN Water Conference on women affected by water insecurity. Uh, and we'll come back to the gender because it's very, very important. Integrated water resource management is essentially grounded in the Dublin Rio principles of 1992. We're going back to the Earth Summit to, to the early days of the concept of the sustainable development of water. And these four principles are the guiding principles of integrated water resource management. First of all, that fresh water is a finite and vulnerable. It's essential to life, to development, to the environment and to everything we do. Uh, the second principle is that water management has to be based on a participatory approach because it affects everyone and therefore everyone should be involved. And in particular, if you dig deeper into that, women are in many countries and many places play a central role in the provision and, the, and, and indeed the stewardship of water and are also disproportionately affected by the water crisis 
and yet they're also very often left out of the debate, of the discussion, and of the decision-making process. And then finally, the principle that is often misinterpreted, that water has an economic value. Uh, now, it's an economic good. People interpret this. It doesn't mean that we should stop charging the poorest and most vulnerable communities more for using water, but rather that there is a need for investment in water uh, because providing water, maintaining the water infrastructure, making the water clean has a cost attached. So we are the Global Water Partnership and we are dedicated to uh, converting the planet to an integrated water resource management approach. We work in over 180 countries with more than 3,500 partners around the world. We organize these partners into country water partnerships and regional water partnerships and indeed sometimes area water partnerships so we can get as local as we want at the same time connecting these best practices to the global level, to the large international events and treaties like the UN Water Conference that just took place to make sure that the local and the regional and the global uh, efforts towards integrated water resource management are connected. Our partners come from all walks of life. They can be NGOs, civil society, government departments, private companies. What they have in common is their dedication to integrated water resource management and to putting water at the heart of development or maybe putting it back at the heart of development as it should always have been. So as I mentioned, we work on three scales, local, global and regional. The formative concept around what we do is, is framed by the sustainable development goals, of course, and not just SDG 6. The whole concept of integrated water resource management is the connection with other spheres of life and, and of the economy and therefore the food and water alignment, the issue of gender, energy, climate action, sustainable communities, and partner with whoever is willing to join us in this effort. So what do we do as an organization more practically? Essentially, we are uh, a convener. We coordinate across the SDGs, but with a central theme of water. Um, SDG 6 is dedicated to water, of course, but target 6.5 is specifically to integrated water resource management. And so one of our flagship programs here around the world is helping countries to achieve this target 6.5, essentially helping them integrate integrated water resource management in systemically across departments into policy at the, at the country level, but also uh, working then at the global level and then to find financing for those efforts. In, in, in this respect, we are guided by the UN's uh, valuing water principle. So in, in essentially recognizing the, the inherent value of water uh, and also in a sense, trying to protect the sources of water, the natural sources of water, educate people to understand how the water systems work, but also generating investment for action on water around the world. Um, of course, the elephant in the room is climate change. The, as I mentioned right from the beginning, the climate crisis is a water crisis. And therefore, we, uh, we really see our work on water as contrary to the wider climate adaptation efforts. One of our flagship programs in, in Africa is the Africa Water Investment Program, which tries to bridge this deficit um, uh, of, of water investment for, for climate adaptation. Uh, we also, and again, I won't mention this too much because Giancarlo will talk about uh, um, water conflict resolution, but we are dedicated to transboundary water governance uh, to try and facilitate dialogue across political jurisdictions. We engage with the private sector insofar as the private sector are composed about 15% of our network, and insofar as those organizations and companies are dedicated to the sustainable management of water resources. We believe in a transformative approach, and we believe in engaging the next generation in uh, helping us decide how we handle these water resources uh, for their benefit and the benefit of the generations that come after them. We also play an important role in sharing knowledge from the local to the regional to the global through our uh, IWRM Action Hub, which is an online platform which helps us share best practices and knowledge and create communities of practice on people who want to work together on specific water issues. 
Um, we, for example, um, I have a lot of uh, leadership in the field of multi-stakeholder partnerships and participatory water governance. Uh, we just published a manual on that. And again, all these resources count on this uh, unique uh, water platform that allows people to engage in dialogue at a global level. So our theory of change really, aside from essentially connecting the local to the regional to the global, is really, first of all, building capacity, uh, mobilizing people, bringing people together in order to improve water governance, to achieve water security, all scales around the world. And in order to do this at the global level, we occupy what we call the soft spaces in between these large international treaties and discussions where we talk to people or to anybody who wants to listen about what we call water alignment, which really is about putting water at the heart of development. The impact can be measured both in terms of investment. Uh, we have helped countries and partners generate uh, find financing for their water uh, governance activities, uh, but also helping people uh, in a practical way at the community level, ultimately uh, make, making sure that integrated water resource management means more better access to water, multiple access to water, but also a better quality of life overall. Essentially, it is a concept that's at the heart of sustainable development. Well, I think over time, but I hope that was okay. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, actually. That was uh, quite the overview of the work that, that, this, uh, that you're doing. Can you give us a concrete example of what it means to increase uh, water resilience or what type of investment could, would have been transformative, for example? So we start with the principle that first you need to improve the governance of water and you need to break those silos between people with different angles, whether it's waste, whether it's agriculture, whether it's uh, fresh water management. So what we do is we operate on a systemic level. So we try and cr help create an enabling environment. And, and this is the case, for example, in, in a lot of the actions in our SDG 6 um, IWRM support program. And then once that's been done, then we move to other actions where on the side we try and um, share those best practices with other countries, with other parts of the world that might want to follow the same path. But at the same time, we then try and put people in contact with investors uh, who are interested to support this type of activity. We are, for example, an implement uh, delivery partner of the, 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 Glo the Global Climate Fund, the GCF. Um, there's all, I also mentioned all earlier the, the Africa, uh, the water, in, the, the investment program, which again helps to do this, this matchmaking. I mean, really our role, we see our role as a convener, as uh, at, at all levels, as a matchmaker, trying to bring together the people who work together. We are not water scientists, but we, we are not policy makers. We bring these people together. And you're based in Cyprus. Uh, I'm yeah, personally yeah. based in Cyprus, but the, the partnership is based in Stockholm in Sweden. Okay, so so that's the, the issue. So that's important. Well, let's move to uh, Professor Sharma here. So what does it speak to you? I think you're, that's what you do, your research is about uh, around the world. Uh, what's, how do you see this type of governance model uh, developing for your research projects? Um, well, Nicholas probably couldn't see, but I was nodding enthusiastically <laughs> throughout many of his points because they really spoke to the values that I think about mm -hmm. and I think that are important to move um, move towards increased water security. Mm -hmm. So I thought this a participatory framework mm -hmm. is, is needed with knowledge co-production from the communities most affected. I really appreciated that Nicholas, Professor Giroud, um, mentioned uh, the role of women. Mm -hmm. um, women are often the individuals most affected by water insecurity. And um, through this panel at the UN Water Conference, we realized that in many countries, uh, young girls and women have to engage in sex trafficking to access water, uh, which is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. um, but in a country like ours, we have 20% of the world's freshwater supply. We have over 9 million lakes. <laughs> Yet hundreds of indigenous communities do not have access to clean water in their mm -hmm. homes. So 
it's not just a problem mm -hmm. uh, in a faraway place. Mm -hmm. It's also a pro uh, an issue here. And I think the the governance and the ideas and the values that Professor Giroud uh, mentioned mm -hmm. really spoke to me as mm -hmm. as trying to actually go towards achieving this UN Sustainable Development Goals. But when we are doing uh, trying to achieve these goals, uh, certainly through a increase participatory governance are we moving fast enough uh, or are we going fast enough is isn't that one of the issue here is that because the climate change is moving so quickly uh, the access to water the equitable access to water is becoming more precarious and is this governance sufficiently responsive to what is happening i would say no mm -hmm. um i think you're right yeah. there yeah. um so you may remember from the Paris Accord, yeah. uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius was the target mm -hmm. that um, the governments were mm -hmm. working together to reach. We're on track to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2023 to mm -hmm. 2026. Uh, that's this year. Yeah. Um, and that was just as discussed mm -hmm. in the Paris Accord. So obviously we're moving much too slowly. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, climate change is accelerating the degradation of water supplies, but also other environmental stressors like, um, you know, invasive species, mm -hmm. nutrient enrichment, resource extraction. Those are all in water quantity, but mm -hmm. also water quality. quality. Mm -hmm. And um, that impacts the people who need the resources. And just, I think an interesting fact is that fresh water just on its own is distributed unequally. Mm -hmm. So most of the world's fresh water is in the northern parts of the planet, mm -hmm. but the majority of people live in the global south. Mm -hmm. So even without climate change, even without global environmental degradation, we had this inequitable distribution mm -hmm. of this important resource. Mm -hmm. And those are just, I think, propagating to further create mm -hmm. further vulnerabilities um, in the global mm -hmm. south in particular. Giancarlo, so your interest in this stems from the idea of uh, transborder or cooperations among nations. Is that what you got from the presentation? Or yeah, I uh, I, I suppose that my perspective on this uh, is is more on what happens if we don't yeah. uh, do a lot of a lot of the things that we're talking about and what are the risks? What's already happening? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so maybe I'll, I'll touch on that just briefly at the beginning and mention like what we can do kind of moving forward and why we need to do that. Um, a couple pieces of, of uh, Dr. Giroux's uh, presentation really spoke to me. So there's the one piece that's interconnected with a lot of stuff, every every part of life. Um, so you know some of the, the pieces that uh, that I see uh, just from my own uh, work with the Monk School are energy. Uh, a lot of energy is very water intensive, for okay. example. Uh, and just to bring it back to something relevant, uh, uh, crypto mining is a very water intensive actually uh, a thing. Uh, so the computers, you got to cool them down. They use a lot of water. They also use a lot of energy and electricity themselves. Uh, and the places where these mines typically are are already in countries uh, that experience water. So that, that's just one thing. Uh, agriculture, um, a lot of uh, uh, countries, um, I mentioned the Global South, uh, Ethiopia, for example, uh, has been experiencing droughts for the past three years uh, already. And then on top of that, there's the Russian invasion of Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, cutting off grain supplies. So there is a cycle of uh, shortages of water leading to agricultural uh, decline, leading to food price increases, leading to um, further conflict, mm -hmm. migration. So this is a cycle, right? Um, so some of these really speak to me. And then maybe the other piece that the presentation really spoke to me was the fact that you see this at different levels. So you see it, at, for example, the local level, um, where you have maybe farmers in India um, that are uh, uh, having time for water supply for their agriculture and, mm -hmm. and their farming. Uh, and then at the maybe a little bit larger level, you might see, for example, there are uh, municipalities and regions mm -hmm. in the Philippines um, that have uh, uh, competing claims over uh, over yeah. water supplies, you know. And then you maybe zoom up a little bit and I'll just stick to that general region there. Um, there's academic literature that actually links uh, water ski to uh, possible escalation to nuclear war uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, India, Pakistan, China region, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, sounds very far-fetched and scary, but 
uh, as you see some of these escalations, there's been a rise in water yeah. nationalism, and mm -hmm. you, you can see how governments, it becomes very politi political as well. Um, and so all, all that to say, just, just to kind of there, uh, there's already a lot of risk. Um, and, and like um, both Professor uh, uh, Sharma and uh, Dr. Giraud have already spoken about, um, this is primarily, uh, we're seeing that the big issues in the Global South, we're also seeing some, some of these uh, peaks in, in the Global North as well. So just very briefly, um, Spain, for example, Catalonia, uh, yeah. big droughts over the past few years. Barcelona's stopped water in the parks. And um, Italy, there, there are islands in Lago de Garda, northern Italy, for example, used to take a boat to. Now there's not enough snow in the Alps, so you can actually walk there out mm -hmm. over the lake. Um, uh, Mexico, a couple of years ago, um, you know, uh, they they had to re reroute water from some of their dams towards the U.S. 1944 water treaty with the states uh, during a drought in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this caused protests and, and at least two people were killed. So all this to say this is happening all around the mm -hmm. world uh, and, you know, paints a bleak picture, but but this is why I think this water diplomacy is so important and it op uh, opens an opportunity for countries like Canada, for example, uh, who, who have, um, you know, just by virtual location, mm -hmm. a really great uh, uh, opportunity to step in and try and help. So what do, would you like to see? Uh, let's start with you, uh, Dr. Jar. What would you like to see for the next little while? I, I, I was struck by the fact that you identify lack of investment what how much money are we talking about uh what's the gap like what are we missing in terms of investment oh we can't hear you let me uh let me go to uh professor sharma and i'll get back to you as we solve your the the sound issue so what would you like to see dr sharma i guess i would to see the people who are most affected by water insecurity at the decision-making tables, mm -hmm. um, at, at the tables where these governance structures are being discussed, where policies are being discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not really seeing that. No. Um, as I mentioned at the UN Water Conference, there was a lot of um, diplomats there. Mm -hmm. But very few people who are affected by water insecurity uh, were speaking. And if they were, they were relegated to a room mm -hmm. in the corner um, and not really being heard mm -hmm. uh, in, in the same way. And I feel like that's who we need to hear because they have solutions. They have ideas. They're the ones most affected by water insecurity. Mm -hmm. So we should be What type of that. solutions would they have or want uh, outside of uh, let's invest more to make uh, access to water better? Uh, I think, for example, for women, mm -hmm. they need uh, safe access, like safe routes to get access to the water or That's technological right. developments yeah. um, that yeah. might bring water to their homes in a, in a safe way. So there are, I think, quite easy solutions mm -hmm. to um, the water insecurity issues. Uh, just bring the safety and accessing water, I think, would be a first step. First step. What about you, Giancarlo? What would you like to see? I mean, outside of putting the issue of water, you know, putting at yeah. the heart not only of development, but of our international discussion in a way. Yeah, totally. Um, so my, my background, I'll, I'll, I'll admit it, I don't feel like I'm an expert, for example, but I feel like I know a little bit more about uh, intergovernmental relations uh, globally. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say is this water diplomacy uh, opportunity, um, from the way I see it, uh, uh, it, it integrates really closely development and security issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I think all of us have, have just naturally seen over the past few years, mm -hmm. uh, the rise in security forums and discussions and, and negotiations around the world. And so I would like to see, um, I think, more of uh, bringing what Professor Sharma is talking about, these folks that are uh, being, uh, sorry, the most uh, directly impacted uh, at what have traditionally been uh, development efforts and trying to also make the argument greater water diplomacy as well from the security angle. Um, so hopefully that would just like enhance um, the reasoning for this, I think, um, you know, 
I think we're only starting to really see from the security angle how big of an issue this is. It was, it was only a couple of years ago, the Harvard Law School uh, National Security Journal, for example, they labeled uh, water scarcity as, as the number one understated risk. globally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Risk Report 2023, it's a big theme as well, water scarcity. Um, so I, I think there's actually a big opportunity to try and talk about um, the risks in, in a security lens. And uh, also when we're talking about development, uh, just to, to really try and enhance uh, the different types of, of uh, multilateral organization, treaties, partnerships that we can we can try and use uh, to improve these. So it's interesting that labeling water as a security risk opens more, more money or more investment or more opportunities for actually action than if it's simply a right to water or mm -hmm. is that is that part of the the land we need to 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 change what do you think uh, um i'm a scientist i don't really work <laughs> in the, the language field so uh -huh. but something i was thinking about in addition that we need from the scientist engineering perspective mm -hmm. is open access data oh yeah um so much of our data in water, that's something a big research is making data available online, but it's it's quite rare mm -hmm. still. And many of these countries don't have an idea of what the water quality is like in their mm -hmm. uh, water bodies or what water availability might be like and how you, know, you might see more prevalence of harmful algal blooms. So I think just having some data and data and that kind of speaks to me about water security risk because you can't assess yeah. risk without data. Yeah. Um, so that would be how I would answer your question. Totally. Dr. Jarro, uh, can we uh, speak to you now? Are you, uh, are you back? Can, let's, let's try it. Uh, what would you like to see and, and uh, any uh, responses to what you've just heard? Did you did you hear us? Uh, we we were discussing uh, water as security risk, uh, and also access to data as being fundamental to the identification of of risk more globally. Um, well, what, let's uh, let's see whether we can fix our not only our water issues but our technical issues here. <laughs> so, so uh, but I'm actually intrigued about. Um, and then you mentioned endangered species or invasive species, you know, uh, invasive species being the ones that kind of come in and create havoc and eventually uh, endangering all sorts of things. Is that, uh, I mean, I see that in plants, we see that in uh, all through the world. Is more of a water, is a water a, a, a real place where that takes place? That, that oh, is yeah. a particularly yeah a, the Laurentian point. Great Lakes just down the street are yeah. a huge hub for invasive species okay. um I think there's over 250 invasive mm -hmm. species because of the Laurentian Seaway right. and the connections to the Bali and mm -hmm. international shipping so we actually have quite a few invaders um and they create havoc mm -hmm. in the water ecosystem so uh, an example you might know of is the invasion of the zebra and quagga yeah. mussels. Mm -hmm. So they came in through ballast water on ships. Uh, they attached themselves and um, and they filter large amounts. Mm -hmm. So our lakes actually look clear mm -hmm. um, because of their enhanced uh, filtering abilities, but they also are disrupting mm -hmm. like the pathways, the nutrient pathways. So they're creating algal blooms more mm -hmm. offshore. Uh, which was quite rare. So we're seeing that in lakes such as Lake Huron mm -hmm. um, and closer to like water pipes uh, than you would have expected because uh, the mussels are usually along the shoreline. It affects habitat for fishes. So uh, because of the changes in water clarity, uh, a popular sport mm -hmm. fish is walleye mm -hmm. or pickerel um, mm -hmm. that people love to eat and it's a huge industry. Mm -hmm. And um, the pickerel actually has like a special layer in it and it can only live in turbid waters. Mm -hmm. 
And because of the zebra mussels and quagga mussels increasing the water clarity, it, it's uh, unsuitable it's habitat for them. So they're declining also because of climate change and the mm -hmm. water is just getting too warm mm -hmm. uh, for them. And in other invasive species like smallmouth bass mm -hmm. moving in uh, and out competing. Yeah. native predators like walleye and lake trout so there's definitely a but lot years of, of re, re, years of research to yeah. to to go on yeah. what what would you like to see in that context though i mean we try to control invasive spe species but is that a, do, is that a governance issue here or is it just a, a scientific issue so in Canada, ontario mm -hmm. we don't actually have any rules against mm -hmm. invasive species uh, so they're actually, that's, we have zero governance. Mm -hmm. We have zero policy. Mm -hmm. um, so the problem's just like, affected, you know, even more. Aquarium, the pet trade, uh, gardening, that brings in a lot of species mm -hmm. as well. Um, and it's unchecked and with online trade uh, and online shopping now. Mm -hmm. um, there's just many more species moving around uh, than you would have expected. So. With climate change, uh, we're expecting to see more of those species mm -hmm. uh, in Canada because of the temperatures being sufficiently warm for them to thrive and reproduce. So it's definitely a big issue. So it's a governance issue it, it is. in terms yeah. of central speakers. What do you see? I mean, you know, just on this issue, it kind of uh, demands more I'm going to log diplomacy in some fashion. Totally. Okay. Maybe uh, the other piece of this yep. that, that kind of stuck out to me, um, like you're saying, that the data issue and and just different areas of of, uh, of research that we can get on that um, that help to speak to, I guess, like the level of threat that we're seeing, so that we can respond with appropriate policies. Uh, so, for example, whether it's invasive species, and we're seeing that, and we we know the causal effects of, of those things. Um, there's another uh, another field that a, a friend of mine does research in. It's called wine economics, mm -hmm. and this looks at the impact of climate change on wine as kind of like a canary in the coal mine for mm -hmm. how uh, how broader uh, water um, issues exactly yeah. right um, and so th these are helpful because you can start to try and have proactive policies so um, th there are definitely areas in Canada um, we talked about the First Nations communities that are still under boil advisories I think there's 28 the last time I checked uh, mm -hmm. since uh, a couple of, um, there are other areas of Canada as well where there are, are you know disparities. yeah there are total disparities and and I don't think all people know we have some uh, there, there's different pieces of the puzzle, right? There's pieces where we need to get access to water for other folks. And then we also need to um, make sure, just because we have a lot of water in some areas, we're not just necessarily using it all the time. Uh, I know in Toronto and Calgary, uh, in the summer months, you can only water your grass, for example, uh, on the days of the calendar. Uh, like if it's an odd numbered day, you can only water your, your lawn if, uh, it, if you're an odd numbered street. Uh, uh, for but isn't that good that we're trying to conserve water definitely i i think we sorry yeah you can just have a lot on so you know, I don't, or just yeah, let's, let's see how that goes yeah. um but but yes i think that it's important um uh, you know this is a canadian um thing that we're speaking to here but uh there are other
Or should we be spending money on alleviating the damages that are being done by global warming? Um, for example, the islands in the Pacific that are facing the risk of going below sea level. Should we be spending money on helping those people or the people in the lowlands in Bangladesh? With sea level rising, they're going to lose their homes. There are many places in the world like that. Is there anything that you can say about that particular mm -hmm. issue? I'm very interested in your thoughts. So two questions. What do uh, non-governmental, non-business organizations like the Rotary can do? Uh, let's start with you, uh, Ancardo. Uh, and what? Sure. Um, first of all, thanks very much uh, to yourself and the Rotary uh, organization for helping to put this on. Um, I, I would say one of the things that uh, is very valuable uh, is just continuing to act as a convener. Uh, and so you know, I, I know that the, the Rotary organization is all around the globe at different uh, hotspots and, and have uh, to try and bring uh, diverse perspectives, uh, something that Massey uh, prides itself on. One, um, to think about the different think about water scarcity in general across industry, uh, uh, also the types of forms. Uh, and so, um, by having uh, these types of discussions and uh, in, in different uh, regions, we can have um, probably more fruitful and more thoughtful uh, conversations mm -hmm. about the experiences that people are having. So, I would say, um, yeah, yeah one of the things that that we need to do is I think just keep creating a space for those voices mm -hmm. um, to to speak about their own experiences and, and uh, talk about make sure that people know uh, the different interconnected uh, uh, challenges that that water brings. So that would be one of the first things that I could do. And that was the early point of of uh, Professor Jaro was the the interconnectedness of, of of how to approach water issues and also the uh, the way in which we we transfer knowledge. Uh, and the Rotary has always been in creating the ability for people uh, to travel and to, to learn in best practices elsewhere and bring them back. Dr. Jarreau, do you hear us? Do you want to jump in into the conversation finally? Yes, I, 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 I hear you. It's still not happening. So, okay. So what about uh, the, the issue, like the, the either or uh, question is a bit scary, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> because you feel like if you don't try to slow down uh, uh, climate change, you're going to have to spend more and more and more on, on uh, creating resilience or uh, dealing with the, the damage. What did what do the scientific community? Well, we think about that a about lot. That? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a question of climate change mitigation, which mm -hmm. is the word that we use to decrease greenhouse gas mm -hmm. emissions or adaptation. And I think we need to do both, mm -hmm. um, obviously. So, without reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, we're just going to have more and more knock on mm -hmm. effects, um, and there's so recently in the last few years uh summer air temperatures are exceeding 50 degrees celsius in many regions in the world mm -hmm. in brazil and asia and africa and the middle east and australia over 50 degrees celsius humans cannot live outside be outside for more than four to six hours in in those temperature ranges and we're already seeing those so what does that mean that means people who don't have access to air conditioning right, yeah. people who live or work outside mm -hmm. um elderly people mm -hmm. are all really sensitive to um to heat mm -hmm. and heat strokes and and death and so i feel like we need to move away from the academic thinking mm -hmm. of mitigation versus adaptation, because we're probably going to, this is going to be quite depressing, 
But in the next three to four decades, um, some estimates suggest that two to three billion people will die um, because of the impacts of climate change and heat stress. Mm -hmm. And that's in the Middle East, that's in Asia, mm -hmm. that's in Africa, and that's going to create all these global uh, conflict yeah. issues. Um, so I feel like if we don't focus on mitigation and just move it to another that's generation's so problem, I don't yeah. know if we're going to have a human race here. To, yeah, yeah. To, to worry about. Yes, let's uh, hear other questions. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Parker. Uh, thank you to the Rotary for doing this and for you mm -hmm. being here. Um, uh, I've had also been around in, in a lot of science, and so I have uh, some questions for you. Uh, when the temperature goes up one degree height, uh, about 8% more moisture goes into the atmosphere. So as temperature go up, we're putting I think it's around 12 or 14% more moisture into the atmosphere. So what goes up must come down. And I would be interested as to know what, are you showing any extrapolations of weather patterns and what water is going to go and where it's going to be coming down in what amounts and in what ways we know it's shifting, but do we have any extrapolations forward in the future? The other question I would have would be is, uh, uh, I married into an interesting family, uh, my hubby's a Harvard MBA, so I would be asking about deliverables. Simply deliverables, if mm -hmm. we have a number of, of communities with no water, how long does it take to get them water? Mm -hmm. You know, and I would strictly be working on deliverables at that end. Anyway, I, and I'd be I'd to see your comments on that. Thank you. What about the, fir the first yeah, questions? Those yeah. are excellent questions. Um, so climate scientists have a pretty good idea of how temperatures are going to change. Uh, the models are quite certain uh, on those ends, but precipitation, which is exactly your question, is, is kind of like not as certain. You can even think about weather, right? Mm -hmm. We can, the weather forecaster can predict what the weather temperature is going to be like tomorrow, but with the rain? It's like touch and go. And it's the same when we extrapolate future forecast to the future. Those precipitation models are still because we don't have a handle of like how clouds are going to change where, like you said, the soil, this moisture, uh, where it's going to go and where it's going to mm -hmm. fall. So one of like when I teach some of this, these mm -hmm. concepts, we just, you know, a general rule of thumb is that dry areas are going to get dry and what areas are going to get wetter. The, those are sort of our vague um, projections. And we have, we're starting to do water level projections while the European Space Agency is putting in a lot of effort on, on that end. Uh, they're not as certain, but uh, it's a first start. So um, that's an excellent question. So when, when the rule of thumb, uh, yeah. drier gets drier uh, and, and wetter gets wetter, is there any technology to actually respond to this? Doesn't uh, we're not there? We're not thinking this way of a redistribution of in water. some fashion. I don't. I don't know about, mm -hmm. about that. That's an interesting idea, mm -hmm. um, but that's not something that, I can. That, yeah, that's not in the cards. Yeah. So, what about your response to uh, what are the deliverables that we should? expect uh, uh, and be accountable for. It's, it's, it, that's another, it, it's yeah, interesting yeah. because we haven't discussed accountability at all here. You know. Yeah. So. Just to say, I mean, I was at those and, and heard those conferences years ago where yeah. water was the issue and all the rest. And here we are all these years later looking at the issue and after all the discussions, where are our deliverables? Where are we going to actually make any changes after all the discussions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's a great question. Um, I, the, what you said, the, what we're expecting and what should, we should be held accountable for. I don't know if those are the same things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, uh, you know, I like to try and think I'm like a cautious optimist, but I'm also slightly cynical in this framing. You know, like you just said, we've had, uh, how long we've had the, the TRC calls to action in Canada, mm -hmm. right? And like how many of those have we really delivered on uh, and how much more progress do we make? Uh, it seems like... It, it seems like the same issues continue to go and go and go. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, 
not in government, so I can't uh, <laughs> can't speak to these things. Um, but um, I, I I think that you know uh, we just have to keep trying mm -hmm. to hold people accountable. I'm not sure, to be honest, what else there is to do um, mm -hmm. except just hold people to flame at yeah. all levels of government um, and just you know uh, use our vote and uh, and try and make it a, a priority issue. Well, having these dialogues kind of energize or galvanize a little bit actions. I, I see that there is an online question. Let's uh, uh, let's uh, go to the online audience. So, uh, so Natalia's Vosno says, noting the current provincial the government's current provincial approach to the Green Belt, what can be done to promote integrated water resource management when the political <laughs> will is <laughs> And secondly, how can watershed-based management be deinstitutionalized as the base of our governance our and governance democratic about. deliberations? Uh, it's really too bad that Professor Jaro cannot, because I would like to have, maybe we'll get it from, from him uh, online. What do they do uh, around the world when indeed they're not being listened to or whether there, there is no political will to actually do what the good governance of water would require? Are the mechanisms we've developed uh, to uh, to institute? But let's. Uh, uh, what about you? Any thoughts on on? Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, the see? green belt and mm -hmm. the destruction of the green belt. Well, does that affect know. your research? No, I I think it affects all of us, right? <laughs> like it affects our ability to grow food. It mm -hmm. affects our ability for water security. Those are important. Mm -hmm. Uh, river beds and water sources, groundwater sources. It affects west um, wetland rest mm -hmm. restoration. The green yep. belt is home to so many wetlands, which are home to most of our biodiversity. Mm -hmm. They're important to to um, deal with nutrient enrichment. Mm -hmm. they, um, they're important for mm -hmm. greenhouse gas mm -hmm. uh, mitigation. And so just destroying those mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. make money is mm. just doesn't make any sense to me um so that's my <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> what about you uh young carlo yeah maybe i'll just uh maybe on the just, on the, uh, the uh, connection uh, with research, uh, um i i so my, my first degree on uh, master was in chemical biology so that was my my little background in science um and so like i think a lot of the science community i think people uh have been feeling a little bit of uh or a lot of hurt coming out of covid just with uh, the the loss, I think, of respect for science uh, generally, mm -hmm. uh, and the relationship between science and public policy and politics, uh, and and this also just strikes me as an example of this, where um, I think we just have to be really cautious uh, and and try and really preserve the trust we have in uh, in you know peer reviewed research in uh, our, our scientists and. I think this just speaks as another example mm. of of um, not trying to politicize science, making sure there's room for science and respecting scientists and uh, their their advisement uh, to organizations or different governments. Uh, and so, um, you know, just like going forward, uh, I think it's just it just speaks to the further need to try and uh, hold what we know to be strong. Uh, you know, evidence-based, peer-reviewed science uh, to the respect that it deserves. Uh, and so uh, whatever example that is uh, across whatever government, um, I would just like to see more of that, I guess. Yeah. So uh, one, we have two, two more questions from the audience. So uh, go ahead, Jane. Oh, um, thanks, yeah. everyone. Uh, so it's, it's true that the some of the solutions just for equity and access are like safe pathway to water, make sure there's clean running water in everybody's home in Canada. Um, yet we haven't achieved that. On the other side, when people say, oh, you know, Canada has so much, like this huge percentage of the world's water, that conversation often leads to ideas of uh, geo, like large scale geoengineering. Um, uh, which could be framed as an equity and access issue. Moving forward, as things become more dire across this continent, especially, um, what would be, I mean, I don't know what either of you think about this. I'd love positions on concepts like geoengineering. So we're moving Canadian water south, mm -hmm. you know, 
Um, so is that a good thing to do? And if it's not, why not, especially mm -hmm. from an equity and access perspective? Yeah, so I guess I'll answer mm -hmm. in terms of what we know about our water resources. Uh, Canada is going to do quite well under change because we have so much water. Uh, there are going to be southern regions that get warmer. We may have, you know, more algal blooms where we didn't have them historically, but they're going to be centered at in the late summer. Um, and most uh, lakes and rivers, you know, there's going to be some, but relatively low compared to other regions in the world. So we don't, we won't have that same in access, in an access to clean water here at a, at a national scale based on like current climate change uh, forecasts. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be equitable, like you said, right? Like there are places uh, that and communities that will be at further risk of uh, degraded water quality, uh, degraded water quantities, water access. <laughs> Talking about Ontario, because the prairies are going to have uh, much less water and much uh, poor water quality conditions. So in Ontario, we're pretty buffered um, to to this. But I think the question was. If, if we are uh, relatively safe, should we redistribute? And is there a technological solution to having icebergs move down uh, to, to, or whatever it is, you know, I, uh, an engineered solution to redistribute uh, fresh water? Or is that indeed uh, another way of creating new problems? I think so. <laughs> So I think so we ecologically would... it creates new problems because we would be spreading our pathogens, our species. So we'd be creating like more invasive species or redistribution of phytoplankton communities that could create havoc in new, uh, new scenarios. So I think as ecologists, we tend to stray away <laughs> from like engineering of <laughs> restoring. Thoughts, uh, and Carlo? Yeah, my final thoughts I'll, I'll give. Um, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to put uh, to just resources and, and technocratic solutions that we don't necessarily have research to, to suggest how it's going to respond. Um, but I will say, like, that it, it is important to continue putting research into innovation. So, for example, like desalination research, I think, is important uh, in trying to figure out how we can unlock larger supplies of water. Um, so I would just say, let's, let's let the science lead us. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have one, one question left. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, one more questions from the audience. Uh, if not, I'm just going to uh, thank you both for, uh, for being here. And thank you, Professor Zhao, for having tried so hard for contributing. And we'll continue the conversation maybe and, and send the comments uh, that you may have had, Dr. Zhao, by email so that people can have access to the, to the wisdom there. So on this note, thank you so much. Any final on uh, more science? That was your final thought. Let's trust the science. And what about you, Dr. Zhao? Um, that sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Uh, water, putting water at the heart of development is, a, is an issue that will continue to be pressing for many, for many nations and for all of us to worry. So I'm glad that we discussed water uh, today and I want to thank the Rotary Club for bringing this issue to us so that Massey community could talk about water. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.